Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the lives of enslaved people through the objects they left behind. On behalf of the New York State Museum and the New York State Office of Parks, we welcome you to explore this topic with us. The New York State Museum is an approved CTLE sponsor. This program is being recorded and will be available to the public and to educators on the New York State Museum's website. For New York State teachers interested in receiving the TL CTLE professional development credits, please fill out the survey and questionnaire at the end of the program. Now, if you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, we welcome that. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to type in anything you'd like to ask a panelist. We will do our best during the course of the conversation to get through all the questions we can within the time we have allowed. Joining us today on our panel, we have Michael Lucas, Curator of Historical Archaeology of the New York State Museum, Levada Nahan, Interpreter of African American History for the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation, Travis Bowman, Director of Collections with the New York State Bureau of Historic Sites and the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation, Matthew Kirk, Education Manager with Hartgen Archaeological Associates, and me, your host for today, Cordell Reeves. I am in the interpretation unit with the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. The topic today is extremely timely and necessary. And it's something that even though people think they may know a great deal about, we actually don't. When it comes to understanding the lives of enslaved people, their cultural traditions in the North during the colonial period, the research is very recent. Most of what we know about the institution of slavery in the United States is Southern based, not Northern based. It's not our story rooted here. So today we're hoping to delve deeply into the archeology span which is leading us to more answers about what the lives of enslaved people experienced during the colonial period. And I would start off by just asking, you know, Levada, why is this there such an imbalance? Why do we know so little about the mid-Atlantic states, even though they're prominent slave states and New York was a major slave holding state? Why do we know so little? Thank you, Cordell. We know so little because the history of enslavement in the American education system has always been attached to the Civil War and enslavement in the South. No matter what subject you learn in school, you learn a blip, a little bit of English, a little bit of math, and a little bit of history. And that little bit of history has erased half of the colonies, and particularly in New York, that was so involved in both the transatlantic and the Indian Ocean trade. The conversation that we're starting off today is hopefully to help us begin a path to correcting that. It is not only about looking at what we know now, but also looking at the lies that have allowed enslavement to continue for so long and to get us back into the continent and to the cultures of Africa. And I'm looking forward to it. And from that, I'm gonna pass it over to Michael. So I want to start out today with a uh, with a land acknowledgement. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So first I wanna say uh, that this is, uh, we built this as a conversation. Uh, so this is a joint effort between uh, all, all of our colleagues here. And uh, so people will be adding into the discussion as we move through the slide. So, we want to start out with a, uh, a background on uh, the nature of slavery as an institution in New York. Uh, 
Slavery in New York lasted for, um, unfortunately, for 200 years from the mid 1620s when the Dutch established the colony of New Netherland until uh, enslavement was, was formally abolished in 1827. So by 1790, uh, near the end of slavery in New York, there were over 21,000 enslaved people living within the state. So most often, um, most often we don't have a name. We sometimes have the first name of an individual. Sometimes, as you can see in this slide, we'll have uh, a first and last name. But the most common situation is where we simply have numbers to represent individual lives. So it makes it important that we represent all the and present all the scan information that we have um, and that we dig deeper into the historical and archaeological um, uh, data for new clues about the lives of enslaved people. So we don't want to just keep propagating the same narrative without critically evaluating that narrative and perhaps a false narrative. And, and uh, Cordell touched on a little bit of that in his introduction. So this is what our conversation is about today and Levada also pointed on that. So we have numerous collections of uh, archaeological collections at the New York State Museum that offer us uh, new ways, new perspectives, on, new ways to look at African-American history and culture in the North and in New York State in particular from the 17th through the 20th centuries. And three prominent examples of this uh, at the museum are a collection of artifacts once used by enslaved people at the Cornelis Van Tienhoven House, circa 1650 in Manhattan, an early collection, early 19th century collection of objects from the home of Prince and Betsy Jessup, a free African American family who lived in uh, Brookhaven, Long Island. And the collection that we're going to focus on today, namely those artifacts that were found in the late 18th century ruins of the John Bogart House in downtown Albany. So interpreting the lives of enslaved people in New York requires us to understand the interconnectedness between within the greater Atlantic world. So from Europe, Africa, South America, and the Caribbean and North America. So uh, one way to look at this is to understand uh, the origins where, where enslaved people were coming from. Uh, we know that at least uh, over 8,000 individuals came, enslaved individuals came from Africa uh, to New York from the 17th through the 18th century. And we know this because there's a, there's a transatlantic slave trade database that record, that uh, gathered all the information on known slave voyages um, across the Atlantic and the rest of the world. And so there are probably many other uh, individuals who came over from Africa that we don't have records on. Uh, and this, of course, does not count, account for, this is just a number that we know that disembarked in New York. So this doesn't count for those many individuals who died in, during the brutality of the Middle Passage from Africa to New York. So if we look at some of these, these are just numbers you'll see at the bottom of the screen. So we have... Um, we have uh, the central area of, of Africa, the Congo area. This was during the 17th century. This was, uh, um, this was a major area where the Dutch were uh, enslaving people and bringing them over to uh, New Netherland. Uh, so you can see there's about 900 people that came from that area. And then also um, uh, Madagascar during the late uh, brief but intense period of, of enslavement in Madagascar in the late 17th century. And then um, the Gold Coast, um, this was later on in, in the 18th century, Senegambia, and, uh, and then of course Sierra Leone. And then other places that are unknown, just some, somewhere in Africa. So the, this, is, this is the level of, that we know. So you can see that people were coming throughout the 18th century from a number of different places in uh, primarily West Africa, but as Levada had mentioned, also um, from Madagascar as well. Uh, but it's, I think for today's discussion, it's also important to understand where uh, enslaved people were coming from in, on the, in the Caribbean, because during the, uh, from about 1720 to 1740, 
Um, most of the enslaved people who were coming elsewhere to New York uh, um, were coming from the Caribbean. And in particular, um, these seven places, Jamaica, Barbados, so the sugar plantations from these places, uh, the Dutch uh, Caribbean, uh, South Carolina, Danish West Indies, and St. Kitts. So these circles you see represent a general uh, percentage of, of people who are um, coming from the Caribbean. So Jamaica was uh, the largest number of enslaved people were coming from Jamaica. That was about 46%. Um, so if you think about this, it, this map really shows that interconnectedness between New York and the Caribbean. Because even though there weren't plantations in New York, plant, New York was part of a plantation system that ranged from New York to the Caribbean. So the, the uh, merchants in New York were provisioning plantations in the Caribbean and often owned plantations in the Caribbean as well uh, at times. So there's a connectedness here. So there's a lot of back and forth traffic. So you're going to find uh, not only um, enslaved people coming up to New York, but a lot of different goods going back and forth. So you, there's material culture that's coming from uh, the Caribbean, as well as cultural practices. And those are some of the things that we're going to be talking about. Mike, this is, this is Matt Kirk. I also just wanted to add with respect to the Caribbean and New York's connection, there's, there's two other main points. One is that New York was actually supplying enslaved people to the Caribbean in the form of Native Americans who were living in the state, particularly on Long Island. There was a sort of an idea that Native folks would make um, great enslaved people for the sugar plantations because they had thought, the enslavers had thought that they, these folks would have some natural immunity to the tropical climate. So it's not just goods and material that's moving back and forth, it's also people moving um, back and forth between New York and the Caribbean as well. And the other point that, that's important to consider is the, the colonial families who are in New York. Both the Dutch and English had very close ties economically in terms of their family units to the Caribbean as well that facilitated this, this interconnectionness. And maybe Travis, maybe you want to highlight a little bit about the colonial families in New York and how they, they're involved with the story as well. Yeah, I think some of the major large landholding families in New York State, in particular the Livingston families, they had plantations in Virginia. There was an entire branch of the Livingston family that was called the Jamaica branch. Um, and they were a huge part of the enslaving market here in New York State. At one point, um, the third Lord of the Manor was one of the largest people, like, people to import slaves into New York State. Uh, we also know the Phelps family had plantations down in Barbados and the Van Cortlands had plantations in the Caribbean as well. So whenever you hear these really big names in New York State history of these big Dutch landholders, these patroon families, they almost always have a branch of their family in the Caribbean. And it's, it's part of this connected market to, this, to slaves as well. We just had a comment from the audience about a very large estate. Um, there was a thousand acre plantation, this person saying uh, in Geneva in 1810. Have any of you come across um, any you know, reference to such a large uh, plantation estate out in uh, that part of the state? I'm aware of some efforts in Bath, New York, which is, which is also out in the southern tier um, because it has a connection to the Susquehanna. I mean, you can get on a boat in Bath and show up in Baltimore. We do see uh, a few efforts in the late 18th century and the early 19th century to recreate a slave uh, plantation economy in the southern tier, uh, particularly around the growth of tobacco. Yeah, yeah, that was what was going on in Geneva. Um, there, I think the the um, uh, the effort there was somebody who moved up from Maryland and brought, I think, 50 enslaved people to to that area and tried to start. Um, tried to start a plantation there um, or did set up a plantation, but of course it was short lived. And yeah, it was around tobacco. Um, so, and there's been some archeology span that related to that as well. Uh, James Dell has done some archeology span on that. So, but that was, yeah, a rare, I, I, that was, I'm sorry, that was a rare occasion. I mean, I don't think, you know, um, I think it's, and correct me if I'm wrong guys, but I think it's more, um, you know, this connection that Matt was talking about with the with the Caribbean, that's really, that's the larger plantation 
uh, sort of um, complex that we should be considering. But I also, while we're talking about plantations, that is a word that trips us up because we keep saying that we don't have plantations here in New York, when in fact the manor system that we have here is our version of a plantation. And because we have a preconceived notion of what uh, a, a provisional farm that is a plantation should look like, we don't consider the manor system and we then blind ourselves to the number of enslaved who are linked to land here in New York. So that is something we can talk about further, but you know, we have our own version. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of it being one large unit of hundreds of people working the land as a single unit, what we do have is these giant estates of thousands and thousands of acres broken into smaller farms. And you have one enslaved person over here and you've got two or three over there and four or five over there. But those tenant farms are in fact producing the cash crop of wheat, which then feeds all of those enslaved in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not just about the trading. It's also why are they being brought here to work? Right. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's very true. I think if you look at some of the, um, you know, if you consider like this slide, for example, you know, there's some of these misconceptions that you're talking about, Lovato, or the fact that we, we focus on this plantation. You know, one thing is we focus on the plantation versus a quarter as a way of understanding uh, enslavement and slavery, so which means the plantation south. So that's one of the problems. The second problem is the is also what you're talking about in, in terms of density or, or notions of scale. And um, so if you look at like this map here, um, and I'll zoom in here, that zoom in, um, you can see, so this is a map uh, from 17, this is a 1790, uh, from the 1790 census uh, overlaid on top of this, this uh, 18th century map. And every one of these little dots here represents a house where at least one enslaved person lived. So you can really see how the density of uh, enslavement was in, in Manhattan. So even though you only have maybe one enslaved person in one house, it was very widespread and actually very dense in the um, in lower Manhattan. And uh, so this is, so we have to think differently about a place like New York. And this is uh, another example, if you, you know, we're, we're, um, we're moving out here to the state level, and this is also from 16 or 1790. The, uh, these are, are um, these are counties. And then you have these, these darker areas where um, this is a percentage of households uh, where at least one enslaved person lives. So in some places down in the city, you have 40 to 50 percent of households um, where at least one enslaved person was living. And I don't know, Travis, if you want to you want to chime in on that. Yeah, I think this is a really important way to look at slavery in New York. We often hear this number thrown around about, you know, how many percent of the population it was or how many people were actually living here. But that's not what slavery looks like in New York State. Slavery in New York State looks like small farmsteads along the Mohawk and Hudson Valley corridors with large numbers of, of enslaved in households. So when you think about percentage of a population, okay, well, if a farm family has 10 children, that's 12 people in a census. You know, so if there's one enslaved person in their household, that's a very small percentage of their household. But when you start looking at numbers like this, you see Kings County, which is where New Utrecht is, and it's one of the places that feeds New York City. The number of households in New Utrecht that had an enslaved person in their house was 75% of households. In places like Ulster County, it's 50% of households. So when you look at the South on the eve of the Civil War, the 1860 census, Mississippi is the, is the highest percentage by household, and that's 49% of households in Mississippi had an enslaved person in 1860. Most of your other states, their southern states in the Civil War, are around 30%. So you're seeing numbers in New York State that are far higher than percentages of households on the eve of the Civil War in the Deep South. Um, so it gives you an idea that if you were living in New York in the late 18th century and you were living in New York City or along that Hudson Mohawk corridor, you were somehow connected to slavery. You 
You might not have had a person in your household, but it's very likely your brother did or your uncle did or your parents did or someone you knew did. And you would be impacted by, by slavery every single day because it's a very small system. It's not a big plantation house you know, and a bunch of slave quarters down at, at the fields. It is people living straight in houses and a very sort of intimate system. It's, it's a very close system. Someone just asked a question about urban plantations, which I guess, which I assume to mean sort of the, you know, smaller farmsteads that you were just talking about in larger cities. Um, would you say the same holds true in New York City? as holds true and, you know, Ulster and other places where you just, people are using enslaved labor um, in a domestic sense and to do everyday tasks. I see you nodding also, Max, if you'd like to chime in on that, please do. I, Dr. Shane White has done a lot of great work around slavery in New York City in the late 18th century. And what he's found is that slavery was beginning to decrease in New York City in the urban areas. Um, People were, like you said, were mainly being used for domestic purposes, while at the same time it was actually increasing in the, in the farm area. So you were more likely to see people who, who had an enslaved in their household in the upstate areas than the urban areas by the time we start to reach this period. Right, and, and in Albany what we see too is that some of the enslaved people have skills, semi-skilled artisans, blacksmiths, but also, as we'll see with John Bogart, he enslaved a person to help him with his uh, sloop on the Hudson River. So this was someone who was familiar with being on a ship. It was someone who had some skills to be able to help with navigation and to help with the upkeep of the ship. So it's not just um, unskilled labor that's out working in fields or, or, or engaged with farming. It's a, it's a very broad sort of um, base of different skill sets that people had who were enslaved, especially in, in the urban center of Albany. And we, I, I really want to emphasize the importance of the urban. The, the houses of the elite, the, the people that, you know, whose plantations are everywhere, whether, whether they are here or not, they are emulating the manor system and the um, higher status of British households. So when you talk about skill sets, the enslaved cooks in these houses are reveling chefs in Europe. When you look at the material culture, not only that the enslaved left behind, but also what the European enslavers left behind, you have beautiful dishes, you have amazing silver and all these incredible textiles. You're not going to have that quality of goods in your house and have slop put on that plate. So when we talk about skill sets, I think that we really look down on uh, the art of service and the, the skills that the domestics bring with all the silks and wools and all these various textiles and the laces that they have to care for, the, the skill set is really high. Yeah, I think um, uh, one of the things that, that that speaks to this idea um, and some of the things that you guys are bringing up uh, with, if you look at this image, you know, this is going back to this, this question of uh, what uh, Lovato was talking about. You know, we think there's this, this the, the plantation being the Southern plantation with uh, quarters where enslaved people were living uh, versus a manor house. Um, and then you look at a place, the places in New York didn't necessarily look like that. But if uh, we, you know, we kind of transition to some of the things that you're talking about now, you know, where you, the situation, so what you see on the, on the screen here, this is a, uh, these are um, quarters from Amelia Island, the Kingsley Plantation on Amelia Island. So one of the things with archaeology is and one of the problems with understanding um, uh, slavery in a place like New York and the lives of enslaved people is if you look at like this this slide here, you see these these rows of buildings. You can see the people who lived in the buildings. You know that probably the artifacts you find around these buildings are going to be associated with uh, the lives of these people um, versus 
like this is okay. So this is a, a house and a outer kitchen in, on Long Island, New York. So you would expect if you looked at this uh, this building here, you know, if you found artifacts around this building, it's probably this is a an outer kitchen where enslaved people were working, probably living. Um, but this is not the normal case. So normally, what you have is just this building back here. Um, so you have a, pl a plural um, environment where you have enslaved and free people living in the same household. Um, and so, you know, it's a little bit more difficult in terms of archaeology to, to uh, um, disentangle that, you know, material culture in terms of, of uh, personal objects. But certainly in, case, in the case of um, something that you're bringing up, Levada about food ways, you're going to find animal bones uh, in privies and trash pits, and those are very much a a part of um, uh, what enslaved people were doing in those households as artisans, as as chefs. So, you know, you just have to look at these a little bit differently. You have to look at slavery. Um, as it, as it existed here in New York. And if you look at um, the spaces that uh, you might find a lot of activity, you look at places like garrets or attics, um, basement, this is a basement hearth uh, from the Palatine House in Schoharie, New York. And this is a, um, an attic in, uh, from Brooklyn. And so these were two spaces uh, of a house that where a lot of activity was going on, a lot of work, a lot of living was being done by enslaved people. So the basement areas, of course, would be especially um, active in terms of, of cooking and a space where allows some, some level of autonomy. And I don't know if you wanna, if you wanna speak to that at all, uh, Levada. Well, we're gonna see this definitely in the Bogart house, but this is where this is why we lose sight of the enslaved because we don't have those rows of cabin. And I think people just really cannot imagine what we know around the brutality of enslavement, that intimate relationship of people living in your house, that they are there. They're not you know, in the back where you can see them if you choose to see them, you have no choice. This, uh, I think this, this uh, quote here is a really powerful quote um, by, uh, that comes from Sojourner Truth's um, narrative where she's talking about these spaces, uh, in this case, a cellar where uh, these deplorable conditions where enslaved people were living. And she talks about the space between the loose floorboards, the floor, uneven earth below, often filled with water. Um, but if you think about this, it's, that's maybe an opportunity, you know, in terms of archaeology, these spaces, you might, we might be able to find artifacts and clues to people's everyday lives that were living in these spaces. Um, and also, there again, the opportunity to think about uh, these spaces as, as a place where some level of control and autonomy and personalization could, could actually happen. Um, so, like I said, in terms of archaeology, this is a this is a good way to to um, broaden the conversation about um, in the household itself and what was going on, and certainly the of course the enslaved people that were living there. Mike, can I draw that out just a little yep. bit more? Sure. Just, I mean, talking about the plantation system where you have enslaved people living separate, right, from from the enslaver and the enslaver's family, but in New York we have enslaved people living inside the house. And we've said that this is an intimate situation, but even still within that house, there is a very clear space that's been designated for enslaved people, meaning that enslaved people were meant to be in the, in the kitchen, in the cellar, or in the, these garret spaces. And if you look at the, the architecture of a lot of these houses, there are separate staircases by which the enslaved were to move between the garret space and the basement meaning that they were not really intimate with the enslaving families. They were meant to be, you know, the, the house was meant, was specifically built and designed to keep enslaved people out of the personal space of the enslavers. That's a really powerful, um, I think, artifact in and of itself. This large, you know, these, the house has a large artifact 
And the way that the house was designed as, as, a, a, as a way to enforce power between the enslaver and, and those enslaved within the house. So I just wanted to kind of pull that out. Even though in the South, we see people living separately, it's, it's, you can think about people living in the same houses together. They were still living se largely separate lives within these same spaces. Before one we the, move on to the, oh, I'm sorry, Levada. Sorry, one wanted, of the most, go ahead. I just wanted to chime in for a quick second with, um, uh, it was a really good comment from one of the audience members that connected, I think, and can help connect some of the things that you've been talking about. We've been focusing a lot in our examples on Dutch and British households and Palatine German households. And they mentioned the French, you know, they mentioned the French. It's like, are the French involved in slavery? Do they follow this same pattern that a lot of the Dutch and British households follow? And why do we hear so little about, you know, French involvement versus, you know, others who have been involved, other European followers? We don't have large groups of French settlers in New York. I mean, there's a couple, I mean, Castor Land uh, out in the Mohawk Valley is one of the examples. We see large numbers of immigrants fleeing after the French Revolution. Um, but for the most part, in terms of our settlement patterns in upstate New York, we're not dealing with a ton of French immigrants. I mean, French, the, when we say the Dutch, the Dutch are very multicultural people. They're, they're very polygot. So, you know, the people who are in New Netherland, only about half of them are actually from, you know, the provinces of, of, of the Dutch Republic. Um, the rest are coming from all over. But in terms of this French connection, we don't see a ton of it here in New York State. And I know sometimes people hear French Huguenot and they think that there is a large presence of uh, people directly from France. Um, but the Huguenots are really intermarrying with the Dutch and many people consider them almost Dutch. But what we see, uh, even at Historic Huguenot Street, we see the same practices that you have here with um, evidence of the enslaved living in the basement of one of the Hasbrook houses or living in the kitchen of the Hasbrook house. Um, and I was gonna say one of my most challenging site visits was actually to Maybe Farm where we were in a house and um, my guide uh, opened the door in the panel wall that led to this basement where the enslaved men there lived. And I was, I was horrified. I mean, I knew it intellectually, I knew it. I knew it was true, but sometimes you just, it's just hard to accept that, that they're in these basements, these cellars with, um, wet walls and damp floors and it's cold and they've been working since sun up to sundown and they're exhausted and and I was to believe that this one narrow pipe from the iron stove that went down into this basement heated that space enough for them to be comfortable and I, I couldn't go there I just really could not embrace what I knew not to be true heat rises it doesn't fall um and it was, it was very challenging and it's challenging. I think that's what we, as we go through this conversation is that all of this discovery is uh, intriguing, but it is also challenging for us that are doing the work. And, and I'll add a final thought. The only large ethnic break we see in terms of, of enslaving in New York is the massive influx of New Englanders who come screaming into upstate New York straight after the American Revolution. Um, so basically, New York State becomes, after the defeat of, uh, well, the, the defeat, if you want to call it, it's the attack of the Iroquois in 1779, where their villages are burned out, New York State opens all that land up into settlement, and lots and lots and lots of, of New Englanders come into upstate New York, the largest migration in American history to that point. And those groups don't seem to pick up the mantle of slavery. And, and we don't know exactly why yet. I'm actually hoping to turn it into a PhD thesis at some point. Um, I believe it's because of falling wheat prices and it just is no longer profitable. I don't think it's anything moral to do with the New Englanders. Um, generally, you follow the money and the money will tell you what's going on. So my suspicion, based on a little bit of research so far, is that the New Englanders don't pick up the mantle of, of slavery because they're not inheriting enslaved individuals from their parents, like the Dutch farmers are and the Palatine Germans farmers are and the Huguenot farmers are. Um, so it's, it's already economically successful for a third generation Palatine farmer to continue the institution of slavery because they've probably inherited someone, you know, at some point during their lives. 
as opposed to a farmer, a Yankee farmer from Massachusetts who just comes into upstate New York and settles in Herkimer County, um, you know, then they would have to make an initial investment of purchasing a human being. Um, and the labor shortages at the time are making labor prices pretty low or labor glut, I should say, are making labor prices pretty low. So I think it's more of an economic issue, but that's the only real ethnic break I've, I've discovered so far. Maybe other folks have noticed something different. So um, what we want, uh, so let's get into talking about some of this archeology, span which is really um, one of the areas that we can, as Lovato was talking about earlier, we can really start to get some new information. Um, and the one site that we wanna talk about, uh, as Matt mentioned, was, is the John Bogart house. So there was a, um, an excavation by Harkin Associates, uh, Matt and his colleagues in 1998 prior to the construction of the DEC headquarters right here uh, in downtown Albany, New York. And you can see on this, this uh, map here, I can zoom in, uh, all these little uh, yellow areas, these are areas where Matt and his colleagues thought the best uh, possibility for intact features and artifacts and so on would be. And one of the things that they found was this John Bogart house. Um, and, uh, so we know, we do know uh, that uh, the Philip Lansing family was living in this house in 1790 and then John Bogart and his family by uh, the mid 1790s. But they were, both of these families were enslavers. Can I, can I just say a bit about the archeology span here, Mike? Yep. So this was conducted over 20 years ago when I was much, much, much younger um, and some people may be wondering, well, why are we returning to this today? What, you know, why has it taken over 20 years for the archeologists to, to think more about the enslaved people who are living here? And, and part of it was at the time, our research questions were focused more on the Dutch and English families, descendant families who are living here, who are the owners of the house. We were also, concerned about larger issues of landscape development over time and how, how the urban landscape had kind of developed in this sort of complex way, but also somewhat in our defense. At the time, archeologists didn't really have the methodological, the theoretical and the analytical tools to really dive into the lives of the enslaved people who were living here. And so, Due to careful archaeological investigation and recordation and the foresight of the archaeologists to have the collection curated at the New York State Museum in perpetuity, it allows us now 20 some odd years later to come back and to start to ask new questions of this old data. And I think archaeology as a profession has, has progressed to the point where we really do have new tools at our disposal we have a lot more data about the lives of enslaved people that allow us to go back and to ask really critical questions of this data that at the time we had an inkling was important, but we couldn't really get our hands fully around it all. And I think that speaks to the, the idea that um, archaeology and thinking about archaeology, um, it's a process. And, you know, 20 years from now, uh, these collections will be available and people will come back and look at them and make new findings. So that's a great point. Um, and uh, else is having some problems here. So this is, uh, um, this is an outline of the, the house that was that Matt and his colleagues found. And you can see there's just a, a small section of it here, but they found this burned, um, this burned floor uh, right here. There's also um, a barrel that was underneath the floorboards, an interior wall, and then a hearth. So this is just a small section of, of, the, um, of the house, but archeologists love, uh, love these fire episodes, especially when we know when they happen. And in this case, uh, 1797, the house burned down and burned a lot of the neighborhood down. So what that tells you is you have this burned floor and you know that the house burned down in 1797. So whatever is underneath this floor had to be, uh, had to be deposited there after 
or before 1797. So it's like a little time capsule. So what we're gonna be talking about today are the things underneath the floor and um, in this barrel, which was also underneath the floor. So this is another uh, another view. Um, this is these are con a conjectural um, outline of the of the building, uh, and this area right here is what we just showed the slide of. That's the the surface area that I had displayed, um, and that's what we're going to be talking about. There's um, uh, this. Here's the um, the barrel feature. And uh, that could, that's right on the side of this, this wall, which could have been, uh, so it could have been right in front of a threshold of a doorway, possibly. Um, they were able to uh, uh, sample a little bit of this. So we know there were probably at least two rooms here. Uh, and this room perhaps being the most important because it's right next to the hearth. Um, we also, uh, we have a, a little bit of information about the enslaved people who were living in the house. Uh, in, at the time of um, when Philip Lansing was living here, uh, we just had, uh, we just have numbers. So we, this is a 1790 Albany census. And it shows, this really, if you think back at that image from uh, lower Manhattan, it really shows the, um, the fact that this neighborhood, almost all the neighbor, all the houses in the neighborhood, at least in one enslaved person was living there. So if you look at this last column here, all of these, uh, this last column represents enslaved people. So here you have Philip Lansing, there were five people living in the, in the house at that time. Um, and then all of his, all of their neighbors. So we just have numbers there, but for the, um, the Bogart family, as uh, Matt was talking about, we, we know that Bogart uh, purchased um, an unnamed enslaved man in 1796 from Peter Vanderlyn of uh, Kingston, and probably to work on, on his, his sloop up and down the river. And we know a couple of other names um, of people who were enslaved by the Bogart family, Jack, and we have this information. This is basically all the information we have. We have information because there were uh, runaway ads. So these individuals ran away to try to seek their to seek their freedom. And so Jack in 1803, and then William in 1798. So even though this was after the house burned, William was probably living in the house at the time. And what's what's powerful about this is we have William who escapes in 1798, but he escapes with his wife, Bet, who is living across the river in Troy, and his children, Charles, and his young children, Charles and Jane. So it's a family trying to seek their, their freedom, probably heading toward Massachusetts. Um, but, you know, you think about this as a very powerful moment. So this is what we know about these individuals. We don't know if they were if they were ever recaptured, if they, they made it to their freedom. Um, it's just something we don't know, but it's, it's basically what we have. And we, but the other thing that we have in addition to this, of course, is the archeology. span So uh, it's important that we, we present the information that we have, but we can, we can use the archeology span to try to draw out some of the stories about the individuals that were there. This is a list of artifacts um, that were found underneath the floorboards of the Bogart house. And one of the, the reason we have this slide in here is it really shows the number of personal objects that were found down in this basement. So as Matt mentioned, we have this collection at the New York State Museum now. It's 146,000 artifacts. So it's a, it's a huge collection of material. And we're only looking at a small slice of this. So when you talk about going back and revisiting uh, some of the other households in this area, there's just tr a tremendous upside and the reason we need to um, curate these things long term. But if you look at that number um, and then you look at the, the artifacts that were found, you have animal bones from cooking, ceramics, you know, 1% of all the ceramics on that site were found under the floorboards. But when you look at these personal objects like buttons and buckles, 
uh, coins, 37% uh, of all the buckles on that entire site were found underneath the floorboards of this house. So that really shows you this is a personal space. So I think that's a very, very powerful um, uh, set of numbers. So let's look at some of the tool, the, um, the artifacts. And we're using the, the term here curated because um, uh, these artifacts represent something more than just uh, certainly things break and they get tossed away, but there's a lot of artifacts in here that were, that were collected for a reason. So it's trying to figure out like what these artifacts were collected for. For example, um, at the top here, we have um, some uh, stone tools. They were probably made by indigenous people living in the area. Uh, the, the two on the top and the one on the, on the far right, a uh, bottom uh, are stone tools that, that were probably made, like I said, by indigenous people. The one on the far left bottom is actually a gun flint. Um, so the interesting thing about this is, and the way we know that they were curated is that if you make a, if you make a stone tool, you're breaking off flakes to make the tool. And so you're gonna find some of those, those flakes, but they didn't, the archeologists didn't, didn't find that. What they found were the finished tools. So it's like somebody went out, they picked up these things and they kept them. For what reason? I think that's, I think what the conversation comes down to. Why were they collecting these for, um, to be used as tools again because they're curiosities? Um, that's really the question and what we have to work through and as part of this conversation. Mike, can I just say a word about some of the metal artifacts too? Yep. You know, at the time of the discovery, the metal artifacts that you'll see in Mike's presentation were, were really just rusted metal blobs that were difficult for us to identify at the time. But what's happened since, in the 20 years since, the New York State Museum has undertaken an effort to curate and to clean and to even x-ray some of these materials. And so now it allows us to look more closely at exactly what type of metal artifacts they were. And, and it also is now thought provoking for us to consider why did they choose these items to place in these barrels and underneath the floorboard. So, you know, again, this is, this is a, a long process of reevaluating and reinterpreting these materials as we gain more information about what exactly they were and how they were used. Mm -hmm. Matthew, that connects really well with the comment from an audience member wanting to know, well, what are the new tools that you've been using from your comment earlier on? And this is a perfect example of that. It's the x-rays, it's the increased you know, scrutiny, but I think it touches also on something that Levada was getting to earlier and also Travis, the fact that we're looking at these objects through a new lens. We're looking at this you know, with new understanding that they may have be they may be of significance and of a type of significance that was never considered before, never deemed important enough to investigate. You know, no one was doing this type of investigation 20, 30 years ago. I remember first, I guess the first mention I saw of any of this was the Lot House, you know, and the findings there in the Archaeology Today um, article. So this is still very recent and all of these new tools are making it possible. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really good point. Um, and, you know, it's not just, uh, it's also things that you can do with uh, chemical analysis and things like that. So there's a lot of new technologies that come along. And so who knows what, what will happen in, in years to come. Uh, well, the one thing I want to say about these, the, the two artifacts there at the bottom, you have a, a chisel and an ax head. And the reason why they're, they're dark like that is because they have been conserved. So otherwise they would just continue to rust. Um, so we've made sure that we, we take care of these artifacts and that they're preserved for future generations. But the other thing about this is if you think back to the Sojourner Truth um, narrative, and these are the types of things you have to think about. Well, okay, you've got an ax head underneath the floor you know, that probably didn't fall through the cracks. Um, so was it put there because it's, a, it's something of value? Was it put there because it was valuable as a tool? Did it have some other use? Um, same as the chisel. So there's lots of woodworking tools, lots of knives and things like that as well. And, uh, you know, and we still have to keep thinking about what they might mean. And it's the same thing with the worked, uh, 
uh, stone tools, they're ancient things. So, um, you know, there might be some other reason for collecting them other than just as tools or simply as curiosities. Here's some other artifacts um, that, and this speaks to what Matt was talking about in terms of, of x-ray and care for artifacts. You can see here, um, most of what we find, or most of what we will have in a collection, uh, there's lots of metal objects and they'll use, the iron objects will invariably look like this because they just rust under the ground, especially if there's moisture. And so these are rusted, they just look like rusted um, clumps of metal. And so if you look at this one right here, when we x-rayed it, you can see it's a key. So even though there's probably nothing left of that key, um, it still gives you a record of what it is. And then you can start to work on interpreting what that meant. Um, another interesting object that was found here again under the floorboards is this pipe here. It's made of catlinite, and, um, which is a, a stone that's found in the Great Lakes area. In Minnesota. So this, this uh, catlinite pipe made its way through, probably through the fur trade to Albany. It's got a, a name carved in the side of it, which you probably can't see. Uh, that's, it says Joannes de Graff, who, who has no relationship to the house. So it was something that was, that was collected by somebody at one time and then either perhaps lost under the floorboards or, or kept there for, for uh, safekeeping. Mike, I have a question for Lavada, maybe that she could she could help me with. I mean, my understanding of the lives of enslaved people in Albany, New York in the late 18th century was they had no personal possessions of their own, that even the clothing that they wore was to be provided by the enslaver and the enslaver's family. Do you have more that you can share about what, you know, the personal effects of someone who was enslavement in Albany at the time might, might have been? Well, that would depend on, you know, one, things they could collect, things that would discard it. And if they were able to make money, could they keep any of that money and could they use that money? Uh, we know it was common to rent people out. Um, sometimes they were able to keep some things. And if something is discarded, um, they are able to pick that up. One of the things that was interesting for me in the whole discussion around the, the knives and the uh, axe, things to use to carve, you know, carving wood in Africa is a major task. I mean, it is, it, it is something that's passed down generation to generation to generation. So it's a creative outlet. What of these things are we finding they could gives them something to do on their own, gives them something to then have that prize that they can use an ax head to take the bark off a piece of wood. And then that gives them an outlet that they would not have otherwise. Um, and that's part of the humanizing of the enslaved that I think that we need to start looking at the things that they collect, um, the things that they hold on to have a lot of things for us to consider. Yeah, and if you think uh, um, about the, the things that they would have carved, you know, wooden objects wouldn't survive in the archeological record. We do have an example of something that was carved uh, that we'll show it here in a minute. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's a, very, that's a very good avenue to start thinking about these, these tools differently. Like these are, these are powerful things that can be used to create other things. Um, and to personalize things. So, um, you know, that's, that's a, a good way to, to continue the discussion about, um, about tools. Uh, some other objects that uh, were found. Uh, now, these are, these are actually found, uh, the, the brass buckle and this x-ray of an ax head. Um, these objects were found in the uh, barrel. So we we took a um, we took an X-ray of this axe head, and you can see you can see like within this right next to this axe head are a couple of pins. So you can see the pins right there's one right here. These these are what they look like after they were conserved. But think about that as we move through the slides, because at first glance it just looks like you have an axe head. You have a bunch of of uh, uh, rust around the axe head. It's conserved, they take off the rust, they, whatever's left over um, is ready for, is stable and ready for exhibition or whatever. 
And, uh, and then there are these two pins involved, but it might be something more. Um, as I mentioned before, lots of buckles were found in this collection. Lots of personal objects, um, uh, things that you would, uh, things, uh, dormant objects, glass, jewels. Now these glass uh, cut jewels, maybe they were collected because of their color. There's two blue uh, jewels there. There's a, a colorless jewel. There's also a silver earring and this copper cross, which uh, one of our colleagues identified as also part of an earring. Um, but also uh, perhaps uh, speaking to a spiritual aspect of these uh, artifacts within, uh, within the cellar. This is uh, another, um, another set of artifacts of, of adornment. The, um, the interesting things here, these are, shell, these are beads. These two on the top are actually glass beads. This, this is a larger glass bead. These are very small blue beads that were actually not found. These are the only artifacts that we have shown here that weren't found at the Bogart house. These were found right next door at the Jealous Winnie house in another barrel. <laughs> so there were two barrels in the Jealous Winnie house and that's a, another conversation, another uh, set of collections to go back and look at. And all these blue beads were found at a certain level within that barrel. Um, so, you know, these very personal objects. So this shows another avenue in the future to look at. Also, um, these uh, shell beads, uh, these wampum beads, this bead, it, it's blown up here, but this is actually the size of a pencil lead. So if you look at um, this blow up here, that was created with a small awl. So if you think of the, the circumference of that is the size of a pencil lead, that's a very small hole in there that was made by a metal awl. And Mike, can I, can I add something about what's in, what I find interesting about some of these artifacts is particularly the wampum, the glass beads to a certain extent. And what I understand of the silver earring that you showed on the previous screen, these were all objects that were being made um, to help facilitate another exploitive economy with Native Americans, right, as part of the beaver trade. And Albany obviously was the center of New York's um, Native American trade. But yet this, these materials, at, by this time, there are no Native Americans living in Albany, right? So these materials were, were around, they were part of the, the environment, the material culture around, but they're being reappropriated for some other use, right? by the people in the house. Yes, but beads, you know, in our modern culture, we really want to look down on beads, right? Because we always think of like these plastic, you know, things that are arts and crafts and come by the barrel out of China. Beads are sacred in almost every culture. They are, they are used as adornment. Uh, we know in uh, what we're learning now around blue beads, particularly within the African culture, um, so this whole art, again, going back, looking at African culture, where are the Africanisms here? You know, seeing that the art of bee making is throughout the continent. The art of using bees as personal adornment to adorn religious objects, and also that copper cross. Many people are not aware that the Portuguese went into the kingdom of Congo and introduced Christianity in the late 15th century. So by the time we get to the slave trade, uh, Christianity is active in the Congo, in Angola. So this is not a foreign religion to many of those that are coming here to New York. So this is an icon that they, they are familiar with. Yeah, and I think that uh, that's a good point that we can carry through to some of the art other artifacts where you have these stylized um, uh, X's and circles with uh, crosses in the middle of them. And this goes back to uh, practices that you see in, in uh, the Congo and Angola, um, certainly from the, even before the, um, uh, the Catholic uh, missions um, in, from Portugal. I'll just add quickly, we recently had an excavation at Senate House State Historic Site down in Kingston, where we found wampum production being done in the basement. Um, so when Matt mentioned an exploitative economy, that's probably what it is. This is a late 17th century when Wessel Tenbrock, the owner of the house, 
is probably having his enslaved crack out wampum because wampum does still have value it has spiritual value you know for the six nations and for the people in northeast and still can be valuable in, in terms of, of trade and in terms of of communication with the natives um so yeah you can imagine saying okay you're going to sit around on your 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 extra time your free time quote unquote and and knock out wampum beads because you come from a culture that's excellent at bead making and you have the skill set to use that tiny little metal all to create those tiny little holes um, so again, it's a much more exploitive thing that could potentially be going on here. Yeah. Uh, audience, wanna... but, oh, I'm sorry, Matthew. Um, I just want to chime in here for a quick second that one of our audience members had a question about the location of artifacts and what that tells us. Would you consider artifacts found around a foundation in the same way that you look at those found underneath the floorboards as having been used by enslaved people who lived in that space? Uh, that's a, I mean, that's a good question. The location is, uh, it's always important and certainly, um, and Matt can attest to this, um, you know, and probably in both of our early careers, we didn't pay as much attention to the location of things, you know. Um, uh, if you're digging an excavation unit, you might just record everything you find in a five by five foot space and a certain distance down and then you put it in a bag. But uh, the location of uh, the relationship between artifacts sometimes can can be something that somebody put there intentionally. So it's try you're trying to understand that intentionality. Was there an intentionality? Did somebody put that under the floorboards because this was a good place to hide that? This was some place where it was in front of a doorway, so maybe it was protecting the the room in a spiritual way or something. So it's the the location of the artifacts do do matter. We don't always have that that level of detail. Can I also just add about with respect to like the foundation and the construction of buildings, right? Colonists also have their own ideas about spirituality and what it means to construct a building. And so colonial builders were also placing into foundations and into parts of the building different artifacts to help ward off spirits, to help protect the house, you know, to, to provide safe passage for the builder and those who are living in there. So these ideas, you know, about what's embedded within the fabric of these houses, that it's cross-cultural, right? It, it's not only the enslaved Africans who are in the house, but it's also the people, the colonial folks who are the, the enslavers who are building the houses, and the people they're hiring to build the houses. They're also, you know, actively engaged in in uh, secreting and placing artifacts into the fabric. I think this is where it's important for us to go back and look at these similar practices across the different cultures. Because we know as we are looking at a lot of the Europeans, there's a lot of shoe, shoes, there's a lot of dolls. Um, Africans don't wear shoes, right? So that's not an African deal, that's a European thing. Right, but we do know also in many African cultures uh, that it is, you know, having an ax head buried outside of the door, uh, warding open spaces, but the things that they choose to do that with would be different from the things that Europeans would choose to do that with. We have spent so much time looking at differences when we really need to be focusing on similarities and then going back and studying the African cultures because that's the, that's the missing link. You know, there's more uh, commonality between natives, Africans and Europeans than, than people wanted to admit. And that's one of the things that's really slowing us down but that's also what's tripping us up. One of the things that's been coming up and the audience comments and questions, um, you know, more than once actually is the idea of personal property. So the idea of personal property among the enslaved, we've been talking about these objects found in spaces where enslaved people lived. And one audience member was curious about, you know, the patterns of ownership and enslaved people making purchases on their own, which Levada alluded to from earlier being a very, you know, on a as case basis, could you earn money? Could you keep 
what you earned, you know, working an additional. Um, but they are wondering if, you know, all of the records that you find in, say, someplace like Virginia, where you have a large number of enslaved people attached to certain larger plantations, purchasing ceramics with their own money, purchasing other items with their own money, if there's any large scale evidence of that happening here that is happening on a similar scale for the enslaved population, or is it just sort of this, you know, incidental type of evidence where you have maybe one or two references to an enslaved person, you know, making a purchase if they were able to work on the side, able to put aside their own money. And, and are we finding people saving to purchase themselves or offering to purchase themselves in the same way that we find um, in some cases later on in the South? I honestly would say it's all of the above. And it depends on the individual enslaver. Because there are times where it's very loose, even though the books say you cannot buy anything from an enslaved and they'll list off several things. I'm kind of curious as to why they keep listing off peaches. Um, it's something that you can't buy for the enslaved. But at the same time, they turn their cheek. It depends on the individual enslaver and it depends also how close or, or far away from a insurrection, whether that is in New York or somewhere else, that the enslaved that this is happening. Because every time that there is a slave revolt, every time there's a slave insurrection, every time that there's something hitting the news or hitting people's lives, the laws and restrictions around enslavement get tighter. Um, there are times when it's on and off the books in New York where you can free your enslaved person, but you just can't say they're free, right? There are, there are steps that you have to go to. Sometimes you actually have to pay for somebody to be set free. So yes, they can collect things. Yes, they can buy things. No, they can't collect things. No, they can't buy things. It, it, it's an individual case by case basis. One other thing to consider too, Mike, is you may recall that there was a fire in the city about four years before 1797. And it was enslaved people who were blamed for that fire. So in the, in the period that we're speaking about, it's a particularly dark time when the movements of enslaved people and their, their opportunity to engage in the, the market economy, I think is really restricted, particularly in Albany, because there is this, this overwhelming fear that they're on the verge of another slave insurrection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is there, with everything that we have seen here today thus far and the objects that you're going to be showing, the underlying assumption here, just to clarify for the audience, is that these are items which, regardless of who they were originally purchased or owned by, made many of them made their way into the hands of enslaved people. Either they were found, um, they were picked up once discarded, or thrown away as trash um, and repurposed, um, or maybe even in some cases, perhaps even purchased, we don't know, but. Um, the assumption here is that all these items, regardless of how they began in life, they wound up in the hands of an enslaved population. Is that correct? Yeah, and I think that's that's a um, that is the you know that's the interpretive um, leap that we're making with. But I don't think it's that much of a leap because we know that, as Matt had mentioned before, we know that these spaces were prime, like the basements were primary. Uh, segregated spaces where enslaved people were working, and so the the um, the most logical conclusion is that this material culture is from the people who are spending most of the time down the in the basements. Um, and you know, when you look at a, an object like this one that I have up on the screen now, um, and this reminds me back to to what Lovato was talking about with carving. This was originally, um, if you look at on the left there, that's, that's what the, this artifact looks like. It's a, um, it's a footed cup. It's fairly small, but it was originally uh, cataloged as a ceramic crucible. And what we found out when we went back and took a closer look at this is that it's actually, you can see on the right, the, um, the lines where the uh, calcium carbonate uh, had formed. So this is, actually a uh, carved shell. 
so somebody took the time. If you set this thing down on a table, it sets absolutely level. Uh, so somebody took the time to create this little uh, cup. Was it a toy? Um, did it serve some other, other purpose? But this is a very personal object uh, that, somebody, uh, that somebody made who was, who was living in the, in the Bogart house. So that's a that's a really uh, uh, I think this this artifact in particular is a good one to to really start thinking about um, uh, and start putting this together with the other artifacts to try to to really um, to really feel the personal effect of these things. This is another object I think uh, that's a very personal object. This is a reticulated cowrie helmet. Now these are found. Um, primarily in the Caribbean, uh, you can see these, these white dots represent where these things have been found, some off the coast of, of West Africa, but not as far as new, north as New York. They're, they're basically a Car Caribbean phenomenon. If we go back to some of our conversations where we're talking about the Caribbean and the relationship between the Caribbean and New York, you know, it's not really necessarily surprising to find one of these cowrie shells in the north. Um, but this is the only one I know of, at least in our collections from Albany. And there, there are a lot of excavations that were done. And Matt, you might be able to speak to whether or not you've seen another one of these. But this was brought up. This was brought up from the Caribbean. And however it was brought up, whoever it was brought up, it ended up in the basement of the Bogart floor. In fact, it ended up in the barrel that we're going to talk about that was found underneath the floorboard. So. And that might give us some idea. This might help us uh, uh, understand what that that barrel might have meant, because this is a very, uh, very personal thing and uh, very unusual um, or very uncommon artifact in in Albany. So um, this is another item that that would, didn't just randomly make its way into that barrel. One other point to make, Mike, with respect to how do we. How do we come to the interpretation that some of this material is directly associated with the enslaved people, the Bogart house? The other thing to consider is we did excavate a privy in the backyard that was also burned in the 1797 fire. And that privy contained a lot of household material. And so we were able to look at that household material, right? And none of it matches what we find in the basement. It's a completely different artifact assemblage. So that tells us we have a baseline of information about what the material culture of the larger household looks like, and it doesn't look like anything we find in the basement. So I think that's an important uh, point to make that also helps us to drill down to say that something very special is happening here in the basement setting. Yeah. And Matt, would you say that the findings in the Bogart house are comparable to other digs from the same period in Albany. So one of the questions that was coming up from the audience, is there any cross-referencing with similar households in the area? Right. And this gets back to the privy part, right? This is an assemblage that just looks very different than what you normally find with typical household trash that's being deposited in these 18th century houses. We don't find cowrie shell from the Caribbean in these midden deposits and these privy deposits. We, we rarely find uh, this number of buckles. We certainly don't find the jewels like silver earrings um, and the, the glass, the cut glass beads like we found. So it is very different. It's just a different set of material culture that's being curated here in the basement. And now, they, when you look at the household as you know, as a larger unit, yes, the Bogart household with the types of dishes that they had, the types of glassware, the utensils, it looks very much like all the other houses that we see. More broadly speaking, but this particular assemblage within the house is very different than what we see in other places. And that should go back to our original point, right? I mean, we are literally at the cutting edge of this research here in New York State. If you want to go see assemblages from slave quarters in the South, you can look at lots and lots and lots of archaeological reports and lots and lots and lots of books. You know, there's only a few of these where archaeologists have finally started to go back and recognize these things. So now they can take what Matt and Mike have done at the Bogart house and at the Winnie house, and they can start to compare other assemblages found under floorboards, you know, at places where we know the Palatines lived or where we know Dutch farmers lived or the maybe farmer, whichever one of these older farmsteads we want to look at, 
And then we can start to look for those larger patterns. But I think we're so early in the research right now, you know, you know, Matt and, and Mike are writing the history books as we speak. So you're getting sort of early preview of what we might be learning over the next several years. I think one of the other slides Mike has is of a daikinga, you know, the, a, a circle with a cross in it. 20 years ago, they would have told you there are no daikingas in New York State. I mean, it was just, it just didn't exist um, until they found the one for Lot House. And then they re-looked at the excavations from the African burial ground. And suddenly, when we start looking for these things, they're all over the place. Um, and it's, it, it's really in the very early stages of this research. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the uh, as Matt was saying, you know, the template we have here, um, you know, we have to kind of go with, with what archaeologists have done, and, and the vast majority is in the south. Um, the, to find a, a storage pit, a uh, subfloor pit in, uh, in Maryland or in Virginia um, is certainly not uncommon within a, a, in a slave quarter on a plantation. Um, but is that what we're looking at here? Is th this is a subfloor pit. I think we can... We can call it this, um, and these things were used for food preparation, personal storage, sometimes shrines or in Kizi that we'll talk about. Um, they're also used for uh, sometimes as sumps. So, you know, how do we look at this? How do we interpret this this barrel? It's a very unusual thing, and uh, going back to kind of what Travis was talking about too, we've got all these collections, and this really provides an opportunity to go back and look at. Well, yeah, what did they find it? You know, like back in the 1990s, they found, you know, they found all this stuff at, a, at one of these uh, historic houses. And let's go back and take a look at it more closely and see if we can find evidence that is comparable to what we're looking at here from the Bogart house. Um, so there are very few examples of these small barrels. There's lots of barrels, and Matt could attest to this in archaeology, especially in New York. You take a barrel, it's, if you have a privy or a well, you, and it's, a, um, it's just an a earthen well, you put, a, a, you put barrels down inside of it, stacked on one, one on top of the other, and it makes a nice uh, 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 foundation for the well so the sides don't cave in. So you see a lot of that, but these small barrels are very rare. Um, this is an example from the 1650s. This is one that I mentioned earlier we have in our collections. It's a Cornelis van Tienhoven house. And this barrel was found outside of a, um, a foundation. It was uh, in lower Manhattan. It's probably original, originally used as a drain, uh, as a sump, because they found the bottom of the, the barrel had holes in it. Um, but the key to understanding what this is, is it's secondary use. So, you know, we're talking about things here that, you know, you have a primary use for a plate or, um, or a bead or anything like that. And then these things can be reused and reinterpreted. And I think that's important as we go through the, the, the remaining of these, of these slides here. So this was what was found inside of, of this barrel in lower Manhattan. Uh, there are uh, the shell beads, wampum beads, the, the glass, a glass bead, um, lots of marbles. So you have to look at this, first of all, it doesn't really look like normal trash. You're not going to throw away 17 marbles. Um, and so if you, if you look at, uh, if we go back to the slide, you can see the plates on, on top, and then you can see there's dirt underneath. So underneath this plate, you have all these artifacts. <clears throat> now, the, uh, the, so the interpretation of this um, was as um, an inkeezy. Now this, this example, uh, this definition here is one definition. This is from the 1980s. And the last conversation that we had, uh, Lovato brought out the point that these things, you know, this is a very static uh, definition of what these things are you know, the communing with the, between the living and the dead. And these things are more dynamic. So, um, I mean, ba maybe at the base you could say, okay, an enkizi is an enclosure. And there are all these things that are inside of it called belongo. Um, and that they represent different things. So in terms of the chalk or in this case, uh, kaolin, they might represent the... Um, 
uh, the, the spirits of the dead, the um, metal uh, nails that you see here, the transformation of, of iron. Um, and so there are a lot of things that, that you can draw, that draw on spiritual um, uh, elements that we know existed in Central Africa. So how these things are put together, the one thing we do know is it's a very personal thing that was used for a specific purpose, whether or not we understand that or not, that's where the interpretation comes in. Do well, you want to have anything to add? Yeah, because this is where we get tripped up, right? We look at things like what McAfee put out there. And one of the things that we have to do, which in all, all areas, is to go back and study African culture. Here we're, we're, we're introducing a concept of uh, communing with the dead, right? But most people are hearing that and thinking straight out of a horror film or straight out of Christian theology. We have to learn a different cosmology. We have to learn a different theology. For most, you know, there are over like 3,000 African religions. But for most all of them, I, I truly believe it is safe to say that there is no wall between the living and the dead. You know, if new age spirituality takes us right there. If we look at indigenous religions all over the world, the physical body is just a casing for energy that transforms. So that whole communicating with the dead isn't like doing a seance. Your ancestors are venerated. They are there to help you. The divine and how the divine is conceived is there to help you. How one prays, how one does an offering, how one looks for a remedy. And that's something very unique to many of the traditional African religions. If there is a problem, there is a remedy. And that remedy means you have to do something. So there are offerings that you make, um, the best of what you have. Metal, the god of iron, is all through African traditional religion. So it takes, it means that we have to, one, dispel this lie that Africans had no culture other than what the Europeans gave them. That is not true. African cultures are old, many of them much older than European cultures. Religions are very different. And we have to step out of that Eurocentric bias. And that's why we are re-examining these collections. That's why we're asking everyone to go back into your collections and look to see how much of this stuff was dug out and put aside because no one really knew what to say about it. And we can't just jump out there talking about stuff until we really get solid in it. Because just like um, many of the Native, uh, Native Americans we work with constantly remind us, we are still here. The practitioners of African religions are still here. So if we're finding these things, it is about creating that broader network for all of us to go study, to decolonize ourselves. And it is a constant study for me. I mean, can I buy enough books? Can I talk to enough people? You know, I'm having to adjust all the time. And as we look at these collections, I think that that is what is important, particularly when we're even looking at um, someone as respected as McGaffey is, he's still in many ways looking through a Eurocentric lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, you mentioned the, uh, you know, metalworking that was very central to, and a very powerful position within the blacksmith within communities in in central and even into North Africa was 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 very important. So uh, going back to the third or fourth century, um, so uh, um, you know that kind of carries through over the centuries. And that this practice, so when you start looking at things like nails in this particular context, they mean something very different. And so it's having that lens. I think what you're talking, speaking to is it's like having that lens and going back to these co these old collections and really having a different perspective on um, 
on what you're looking at. Mike, can I just jump in real quick and quick go back if possible to, to that slide too? Uh, you and I had talked about this the last time we, we kind of got together and I think it's your interpretation that what we see at Broad Financial is that this was a single cashing event, right? Mm -hmm. But what I wanna kind of tease out of this though is even if this was placed at one time, that this was a behavior that was ongoing for a long period of time before that. Regardless of how we interpret the material, it took a long time for someone to figure out which items to curate. Mm -hmm. And so it was, a, it was a very deliberate process, mm -hmm. one that someone was always engaged in to find the artifacts, the material culture that they thought was important to incorporate within this, this cache ultimately. Yeah. So this is part, what we're seeing is the end point of something that may have been taking place over weeks, months, years, so it, it really is something that's part and parcel of someone's life on a, on a daily and ongoing basis. And archaeologically, we see the terminus of this and the caching of these artifacts. But to Levada's point, this is really something that's ingrained, that's, that's a spiritual part of someone's life. And we quite don't have a grasp yet on exactly what, what these objects mean. But we can say for certain that it meant something very, very special and very important to the people who are engaged with the, the process. Absolutely. Because with many of the Nkisi, at every with every prayer, with every request, you're adding, you're adding. You know, a nail is being driven in, a an offering is being made. So it it isn't always built all at one time. It is that going back, that's going back. You know, I, another request, and so you're adding, and you're adding what you can find that is for memory, very important because we really do have um, enslaved being directly imported from Africa for a long time. Mm. So it is a while before we are in that domestic, you know, domestic enslavement process. Uh, and by the time we get to the domestic enslavement process here in New York, we're ending enslavement. So we have people coming from the continent all the time, coming through places like Brazil where those uh, connections to Africa are a lot more active and a lot more dominant coming out of the Caribbean. So those aren't, that's not lost memory. This memory does not get lost for a while. I wanna, I wanna skip uh, forward here a little bit and start talking about the, the artifacts from the Bogart barrel um, and uh, along this line of thinking, like whether or not this is, whether we think this is really one of these in Kizi or whether it's something, you know, probably more close to what uh, Lovada is talking about, something that, and Matt are talking about, something you add to over time. Because um, if you think about this barrel, there's so much stuff in here and we're only showing a few of the artifacts that were found, um, but there's 16 knives were found in the barrel, okay, that's unusual. That's somebody, like, like Matt was talking about, you don't just go, I'm gonna go find 16 knives. I mean, this takes a long time to, to curate these objects and whether or not they were put in at the same time, maybe they were put in at different times and this is an ongoing thing. And if also, the other thing I don't have up here, but, um, or am I gonna show is the, the number of uh, faunal remains, uh, animal bones from food. So they didn't just take a, a uh, you know, it's not just uh, one episode of taking animal remains and or food remains and throwing them down into this this barrel, along with uh, uh, oysters and so on. I mean, this is a con continual process. So it looks like it probably was something that people were going back to. Um, and so if you look at some of the objects here, you have things like iron chains and you can see the, the x-ray there and what it looked like before. Uh, there's a horseshoe clamp. Um, this object in particular, this is something, it's a leg shackle called a bilbos. It, uh, if you look at the bottom, you can see these are um, shackles that were recovered from a ship called the Henrietta Marie. It was a slaver ship that went down off the coast of Florida around 1700. So you can see that bar going through it. At the top is a bar that was in that barrel. That is the bar from one of these, these shackles. So. Um, these are objects that are collected through time, but obviously are very powerful uh, objects. The other thing that was found in here and under the floor, are all these marked objects. 
Um, and hopefully you can see this okay. There's a, there's a marble there that's been carved with what looks like a bee and we've outlined it there in black. Um, a couple a knife that's just been, uh, uh, there's a couple parallel marks on it. There's a knife that's been marked with an X and then an awl that's, that has been uh, marked with a GW on all four sides. So lots of things that have been marked. Um, this is one of the more interesting artifacts, I think, and it goes back to why you have to go back to these collections and really look at them carefully. Because if you look at this just on the surface, it's a, it's a piece of stoneware, it's a probably locally made stoneware, but it's got all these marks on it that you can't really see, so we've highlighted them. If I could zoom in, you could see the, the marks. So it's got marks that were put on the piece uh, before it was fired. So whoever made this put these marks on it. But so it wasn't somebody that was living in the Bogart house, but it's a good bet that they collected this because of these marks. So and going back to, to what um, uh, what Matt and Lovato were talking about with these, these symbols, um, this looks very much like what you would see um, in the uh, Dikenga, the B Bakongo Cosmogram. And I guess uh, Travis had brought that up. Um, you know, this is the, represents a continuation of life, life and death, uh, uh, birth uh, and, and death, and uh, the underworld and the world of the living. So this is something that you see this, this uh, marking in other places. There was, if you look up the right-hand side, this is a cosmogram that was found down in Germantown, New York, um, in a basement right next to the hearth on, on the mantle. Uh, carved into the, the, the hearth. So these things are, are showing up. So you, know, you look at, there's other marks on here, lots of X's. Um, and so maybe this, this piece, this broken piece of pottery uh, that seems like you know, to one person is just a piece of trash, but to another person has these powerful symbols on it. Um, so this is, you know, this is why we have to think about, okay, the context of this. This is part of a con maybe a continuation of, of putting things into this barrel. And this was one of the things that was put there. Uh, this is another example that I think Travis brought up um, from these corn cobs that were found in the, um, and I showed a picture of that Garrett from the lot house. And these were found right underneath the floorboards. So, you know, you could say, well, these are our corn cobs under the floorboards, right? But they're, situated in such a, a way as a form of a cross. So the people who were uh, excavating here, this is how they interpreted these, these objects. But it wasn't just these, there were also other objects underneath the floorboards as well. So this was definitely someplace where people were placing um, material culture intentionally under the floor. And then, so if you start thinking about these other artifacts that were found, um, either in the barrel or outside of the barrel, um, you start wondering about, are these core symbols? So um, this one at the top here, um, I just recently discovered, thanks to my good friend and colleague, Paul Huey, has done an article on this. This is something called blue and white, uh, blue on white Brittany. It's a, uh, it's a Dutch ceramic, it's a tin glazed ceramic. And, but I think it was, you know, it was probably collected because of these symbols on the center. Um, you have these concentric circles. This is the same, uh, uh, at, and there's a plantation site in Brazoria, Texas called the Levi Jordan Plantation. And the two most common symbols found there were these concentric circles and the six pointed star. So we know that there were, um, there were enslaved people coming from the Caribbean uh, to the Levi Jordan plantation. So, you know, you, you think about it, you have Texas and New York, they're a long ways apart, but there are still these connections that are interwoven between these places and the Caribbean, and then of course, back to Africa. Um, these ones on the bottom, and this kind of speaks to how do we know that these things were collected because of these symbols? So these are two very large pieces of ceramic. They probably didn't just fall through the floorboards. They were found underneath the floorboards. I should say all of these objects, these were not found in the barrel. They were found under the floorboards. These are the only pieces of these two ceramics. This is a cup, this is a saucer. 
So they only kept these two pieces. So there's not any rims or anything that go along with these. So the logical conclusion is that they kept these things because of this symbol that was on, on the uh, pottery. And then, then that leads us down this, uh, the interpretive trail that Lovato is talking about that we don't know. We have, th this is what we do know. They were probably saved because they had this mark on them. Then we can start this, this uh, interpretation of trying to figure out what exactly they mean. And that goes back to comparing with other collections, um, old collections and collections that people have in their, um, you know, at these historic houses that they don't really know what they have. So the final thing uh, I wanted to, to show here was, was this collection. Somebody had, in the audience, I think, had, had mentioned, you know, the, the placement of objects. And this one, you can see there's a, there's a red dot right here. They were all found in one place. So on the surface, they look like they're just regular everyday things that people use and then lost or they broke, uh, you know, plates. There's an iron here, a clothing iron. We know there was work being done. Clothing was being mended, it's being ironed and so on. But they were all found together. There's a whetstone again. There were three whetstones that were found. <laughs> the interesting thing, in the barrel, there were 16 knives and, the, and a large whetstone as well, which so there's three, three whetstones that were found throughout the, 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 um, the building underneath the floorboards. And in this case, you have one here, um, but then you have all these other objects. So were they put there intentionally? Um, that's a good question. We're not exactly sure. But if they were, then of course, they would mean something else rather than just an iron or a brick or a, or a piece of pottery. And that's why you have to critically go back and look at these things. Um, and then this is just the layout of the floor again. So if you think about this, you've got the, you've got this area here that's, uh, that's say um, uh, the living space. You've got the barrel here. You've got a collection there. You've got all this stuff under the floorboards. So you can think about this space as, as an area that was an opportunity to, to um, uh, carve out uh, an autonomous space. And you know this this barrel right here could have been right in front of a doorway. So perhaps it's very meaningful. Going back to what Lovata said, um, the, uh, um, the axe head that I showed that had the, the uh, pins around it was actually found in, in this barrel. So, uh, so it's possible this had a protective function at one time and then maybe some time later it had a different function. So it was used over the course of, um, uh, of its history. So I don't know if anybody else has anything to add or if, if there are other questions from the audience. There are many, many other questions, far <laughs> more than we will be able to get through in the time that we have left, unfortunately, because we are actually already over time. But I want to um, address two, and I'd open both questions up to whoever wants to take them. Um, and I please keep your answers brief as possible. So. We want to share some additional information with the audience before we sign off. But this question came on and came in at the very beginning of our presentation, asking about a large conch shell, or if there was a large conch shell in the museum collection that came from an archaeological context at the Philip Schuyler House in Saratoga, or Schuylerville. Um, and is there any assumption that maybe if it does, if it isn't within the collection, is there any association with enslaved people? or the person who lived there and how would they be able to find out more about it? And I would say to any of the museum staff who are on behind the scenes also, if you can answer this question directly in the chat um, or directly in the Q&A to the audience member, please feel free to do so. Um, but does that sound familiar to anyone um, currently on the panel? Okay. I, I guess not. Um, the other question that came in that I thought maybe we could answer briefly um, is the question of half free. You know, so we know among the Dutch in New York City, we find um, this idea of half free individuals um, who are enslaved, um, but are giving a limited, a very limited um, and very tethered um, situation, not really freedom, um, in New Amsterdam. Does that happen 
upstate is the question. Uh, uh, there is only a few people who attain half freedom. And those were those, um, the initial 11 enslaved and their wives. Otherwise, even in most manumission records, there's something that brings, have to, a uh, requirement that brings them back, right? We will free you, but once a week, you got to come back and do blah, blah, blah. We will free you, but at harvest, you got to come back. There's always strings attached. Um, and the whole concept of half free, please remember, they, the adults were half free, their children were fully enslaved. So this is really, uh, we had um, people saying, oh, well, they're being, you know, considered as indentured servants. No, they're not. This is about the Dutch codifying slavery. This is about people starting to say, what does it mean to have enslaved people in our lives? Um, but even with the half free, they have to pay for that. They have a hog and their requirements, right? If they don't meet those requirements, they lose that half freedom. So it's a, you know, people put a lot of weight in that. I'm sorry, I don't put a lot of weight in that because you got to do the hog to remain free. You got to come back and work for so long to remember, be half free and your children are not half free. They're enslaved fully, completely. That's a great point, Ivana. Thank you for clarifying that. And I, would, I, I would just add one thing to that, like, and Matt can attest to this, the, uh, when the Tenbrooks, I think Elizabeth, who was, who was uh, freed at the Tenbrook mansion, and this was in 1810, she was required to come back and do all the duties that she did before. So she was, she was free and she got to come back and really do all the things that she was doing uh, when she was quote unquote enslaved. And she was not paid for that. No. To not do that, they could revoke her freedom. The other thing we do see very late in, as we get into the 1820s, and Shane White again wrote a great article about this, is just letting people walk away. Um, so they weren't actually ever given, you know, formal manumission papers, um, but they were allowed to just walk away. A lot of times we'll start to see runaway ads where the posting of the reward is one penny. You know, so it's just enough to assert that ownership, but not enough that I don't really want this person back. Um, so and it, that is because a bond often there's a law on and off New York books where you have to pay to right. free your slave. Right. To free an enslaved person, they have to be uh, physically examined by the man, uh, manumission of the poor, right? So they will not become a burden on the community. Then on and off the books, you got to pay a 200 pound bond per enslaved person to free them. And then you got to pay 20 pounds a year. They don't want a free culture here. And that's what happened to Catherine Van Cortland Phillips' slaves. In her will, she had set up to free her enslaved. But when she died, that law was on the books and they could not be uh, freed because that money had not been put aside. Sorry, it's a sore point. <laughs> no, that, that is a very important point to make. I think it's a point that many people are largely unaware of. You know, all of these restrictions placed on manumission and even as you know, Matt uh, was alluding to earlier, you know, if you were forced to come back, or I think it was Michael Lucas, were forced to come back and work for your former enslaver, that's also preventing you from going out and finding new sources of employment to sustain yourself and to build your own life. But I just like to ask the panelists all if they have any suggestions for people who want to learn more about this topic. We are way over time at this point, and we do need to close the session, but do you have any suggestions for upcoming programs, upcoming, um, or even, even online resources that you would suggest very briefly to the audience if they want to learn more about this topic? One of the things I always, that was suggested to me way back in the day, uh, try to find a cultural atlas of Africa and go study Africa as a continent and break it down to country. Look at uh, books by um, Thompson and others who have been studying for years and writing on African cultural traditions for years. There's a great book by Holloway on Africanisms. So, you know, I have a friend who often says you can't uh, see Africa if you don't know Africa. 
So we have to go back and study the cultures and we have to remember that Africa is a continent and not a country. Thank you, Levada. If no one else has anything they'd like to add, at this time, I'd just like to thank all of the many people behind the scenes, um, Catherine Buller, Kate Morehouse, who made this show run smoothly. Um, also all the tech staff and AV staff at the New York State Museum for pulling all of this together and our audience for today. Thank all of you for taking the time out to learn more about this important research. New York, before it becomes a bastion on the Underground Railroad, is a major slaveholding state, and more people need to know the complexity of that story. So I encourage you to continue to do your own research, continue to delve deeper into this topic. I apologize to all of those who submitted comments or questions that we were unable to get to and answer during the session, but please come back again where you see similar topics advertised and hopefully we'll be able to address some of this. Thank you again for joining us today and have a good afternoon. Goodbye.